Okay, so um, what I was going to say as far as being an, the outsider here is, I, I, for those of you that are here that ski Bridger, uh, yesterday I went up, uh, I think, Powder Park or Alpine. Which one is it? Which one's the farthest? Alpine's the furthest. So I went up Powder Park and I skied Bobcat and Porcupine. And there's this big gully in Porcupine. And I was super pumped that I made it without crashing. So, <laughs> and my kids were like, I took my kids with me yesterday. And my kids were like, Dad, I don't know if you should come down this. So <laughs> that tells you like my level in the, in the, in the snow world. Um, so, as Doug said, I'll give you a quick background to myself. Um, I retired out of the Army in 2011. Uh, I spent a number of years as a helicopter pilot for a special mission unit. Um, if any of you have ever seen Black Hawk Down, uh, the little the black helicopters, or Zero Dark Thirty was another one where we went to get uh, Osama bin Laden, that was the unit I was in. And so, um, any of you familiar with the military or can kind of understand this, uh, you have kind of special forces, rangers, Navy SEALs, those guys. I didn't work with any of those. We worked above that level. Um, so uh, when you're at a, at a level like that, like you guys are in the fields you work in, very elite level, have a very good understanding of what you do. Um, there's a certain way you start thinking about things and the training that's done is, is a different type of training probably than you get at the lower levels. Um, and so when I left the military, I was then, uh, uh, the, the last year I was in the Army, I ran a school called SEER. Is anybody familiar with SEER? Okay, a couple of you folks. Stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. And we teach uh, uh, our pilots and our elite level folks um, how to do those things. And so I ran that school for the last year I was in the Army. And then when I got out, um, I worked uh, uh, for, a, for a facility um, teaching classified stuff in that realm, but even uh, more advanced. And a lot of that training that we gave people and that we were, all went through ourselves was, was for the brain. And how does the brain um, react under extreme stress? So if I take any one of you and I place you under extreme stress and I train you how to perform inside of that stress. So that's kind of where we're gonna to go today with this. Um, I've, I already saw with Eric's uh, performance uh, uh, presentation he just did, I was like, oh man, this ties in great. And, uh, and with some of the stuff Ron said earlier in his, I was like, oh man, this is actually gonna work out, right? <laughs> so, um, I do give uh, presentations to some large organizations, corporate organizations, and what was really cool is being able to present to real people um, that, <laughs> that like when one o'clock came, we started. And I was like, wow, this is great, right? Because when one o'clock comes in the corporate world that I've presented in a few times, um, we're not even back from lunch. So you start about 1.15. Um, all right, let's see. So this is kind of what we're gonna go through. This is the agenda, uh, crisis management. Um, and, and you guys will notice these are probably things you guys are doing off and on throughout both your life and as well as your profession. Situational awareness, how that plays in, then the decision-making process, and what our response is once that extreme stress sets in. And then we'll conclude this thing. So um, before we get started, have, have any of you guys read any of these books? Blink is probably one that most people read. Uh, a great book about how our brain kind of recognizes patterns um, that come into all the experience you guys have in your field. You, you recognize something, you don't really know how you recognize it, but you recognize it. And that, that book goes into quite a bit of that. Has anyone uh, read Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman? Okay, good, great book, great book. And probably I would tell you, if you read this and you like this, or even if you haven't as the starter one, 
The Art of Thinking Clearly. Has anybody read Art of Thinking Clearly? This is a book, uh, kind of based off Kahneman's book, but this is an author um, that uh, he breaks it down to basically two or three page chapters. And in this, he talks about all the cognitive biases, not all of them obviously, but many of the cognitive biases that affect our decision making. And it's two or three page chapters that are, you know, they say, why do you make this decision? Well, you make this decision because you've grown up learning things a certain way. A lot of them aren't even right, aren't even true. And, and through experience, we kind of flesh those out. But what I would tell you today is, what if instead of having to flesh those out each time they happen, what if you read a book like this, aware of all these biases that happen in your life, how would that affect you? And we're gonna talk about some of that. All right, so before we get started, can you pull that up before yeah. we do it? All right, um, and, and just pull it up if we can pause it. Have any of you guys seen the monkey business illusion? Anybody familiar with that? Feel you? Okay, don't ruin it for the group, all right? We're gonna start out with this, um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of pause it once, and then we'll talk through it. Ah. <laughs> I always mess it up. How many of you guys got 16? How many of the honest people got 16? Right. Uh, what else did you see? Gorilla. I did see the gorilla, although I got the answer wrong. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, truthful show of hands, who did not see the gorilla? Okay. So that's about, that's about average. Somewhere around half of the people don't see it. All right, so for those of you that saw the gorilla, what else happened in this video? Because there were other things going on in the video. Anything else that you saw in there? For those of you who haven't seen. Background changed color. Background did change color significantly too, not just like a shade. Significant. What else happened? Anything else? Oh, that it went from three to two people. Uh, on which scene? The ones black that black team. A lot of people don't actually get that, so we're we're ahead of the game. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit play again. It's gonna kind of rewind. So now that you guys know the answer, check out what's going on. Sixteen going passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. <laughs> When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. <laughs> and that's the monkey business illusion. All right, so I like to start that out really uh, for no reason, just because it's fun. No, <laughs> it gives us a sense of right here, we're here, it's after lunch, we're relaxed, we're in a good atmosphere, among good people, things are good. And this is how our brain thinks. We miss things, right? Even when we're relaxed. So what happens when an extreme stress event sets in? What changes in our brain? And how can we be prepared for that? And that's kind of what we're gonna look at. All right, so crisis is just a time when a difficult, important decision has to be made, right? How many of you have been through a crisis? Do you feel, okay? Some events happen where you're just like, whoa, I got to figure this out and I got to figure it out now or something bad is really going to happen. I'm sure a lot more of you actually than, than raise your hand actually have been through some event like this. Um, you, you maybe just don't think of it that way or realize it, but as we go forward, um, uh, we'll, we'll show you that. So where I used to work, one of the things we used to do is take people hostage. And, and we actually did this, right? Uh, <laughs> And so, and usually, usually they were um, uh, often powerful people, um, and they 
they kind of knew they were in training, but they didn't know what was going to happen. So there's a fair amount of fighting back. And um, these are good fighters. So it would take a number of us to throw them into a van or whatever we might do. And, and you know, we grab them, take them hostage. So you develop some good techniques and you got, you got some gear, right, to, to make this all happen. And, um, and uh, so this is going to a story. Uh, my wife uh, and Doug and I are friends. He knows my wife, Ron. Got to meet her last night at dinner. Um, my wife gets a lot of like special ops wife training. Um, some that she likes and some she doesn't. Um, and so we lived over in Washington State and we lived out on some acreage, great place up against the wood line. And one, one morning, four or five years ago, I woke up, walk outside in the morning, realize she's already out there early and she's watering the flowers. We had this flower bed that goes all the way, you know, kind of down our lawn right up to the trees and she's down there. So I, I walk out there and be a good husband and go say good morning. I start about halfway across the lawn. I realize she's got earbuds in. Huh, guess what? Time for some training. <laughs> <laughs> We're at a point of low situational awareness. We need to pay for that. So as I've been trained to do, walk up, grab her and I take her right into the wood line where I have my stuff, put her in this cage, and keep her for two nights, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> that part's not true. <laughs> Although I was given a presentation one time and he used that example, and, and one of the women that was in the presentation said, wait, you kept her for two nights? And I was like, like one night's okay? <laughs> so. But I, but I did grab her, right? And, and because she's had some, uh, that special ops wife training, I kind of got away from her real quick. And a couple, <laughs> a couple weeks later, when we start talking again, um, she, she said, I said, what was going through your mind? Because that's a crisis situation, right? You just went from regular life to crisis immediately. If somebody grabs you, you don't know what's happening. And I said, what was going through your mind at that time? And she said, I was, I was thinking about what I was gonna do next. And that's a pretty good start along the spectrum. That's pretty far along. What you would hope to do is do something immediately, right? Not, not I was about to do something, I was thinking to do something. We wanna get to the point where you're doing something in crisis. And I would, I would imagine for those of you, especially those that work out in the field uh, in these scenarios, you will understand this and we'll talk about it later. Hesitation can kill you, right? You have to sometimes make the decision immediately to avoid the crisis situation, okay? So hopefully what I'm gonna talk about kind of pushes us to that level. Because when we get to this crisis situation, our brain responds very differently, okay? Um, as, we, as I took these people hostage before, if I took Ron hostage, right now, sitting in this room, I could say, all right, you know what? Was it Luke? Yeah. Luke, if I took you hostage, what would you do? You know, if I was grabbing you, and you say, whatever it is, I don't know, you know, do a haya karate chop on me, right? Yes. And that's what we, our brain believes truly that we would do that, sitting right here. But guess what? Your brain probably wouldn't do that, is the truth, okay? Unless you do some certain things first. Because when this happens, it, we've probably all heard of the fight or flight mechanism. Correct? Most of us anyway. Why do they call it the fight or flight mechanism? Does anybody know? When you teach this in, in your class somewhere? Because it rhymes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because what's the full human law? Fight, flight, or freeze. That's the full human law. But we never hear that part. We just say fight or flight mechanism because it's easy to say, right? It's easy to teach that way. But the truth is, the majority of people, when faced with extreme stress, guess what they do? Freeze, right? This may have even happened to you. The, the best example I give is, for those of you that have driven in the snow before, <laughs> I, I use this example teaching this, but usually it's not with people that all drive in snow. So, 
the very first time this happened to you, whether this was when you were young or later, but usually it's when you're young, and you go around the, car, the corner and the car starts to slide out, right? What's, what's your initial reaction? Ugh! And what happens if you don't have life experience in this or you haven't been trained in this, hopefully, you know, by a caring parent or something, pretty much your full reaction is, ah! <laughs> Till the car stops, right? Or you hit something, right? Because we don't know what to do. No training, no life experience. So after that, you go home and you say, wow, guess what? Mom, dad, whoever it might be, guess what just happened to me? I went around the corner, ah! and they're like, oh yeah, what you're supposed to do is counter steer, take your foot off the accelerator, slowly brake to a stop. Ah. And you're like, wow, I wish you would have told me that yesterday, <laughs> right? But then if we go out and we have that parent or whoever that may be, and they take you out to a parking lot and they let you do this, you start to gain experience through training. You've gained some through life experience already because it happened to you, okay? You might not know the solution. If your brain works under crisis, when that hamster wheel starts to roll, if you don't have a plan in there, guess what? That's all it's doing. That hamster wheel searching, 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 it doesn't have an answer. Does that make sense? Okay, this is probably all stuff you guys already know, right? But maybe I'm just reinforcing some of this. So, how do we get to that point? Well, let's talk about normal thinking versus crisis thinking, right? Our normal thinking is made up of a whole lot of stuff. Um, Eric was just talking, these biases, right? And as I heard the discussion at the end, all of the discussion points you were bringing up was why older people shouldn't be dying. We have more experience. Uh, we recognize patterns. Um, we, we see these things, uh, these images that, that you guys were talking about. Well, all those things should be the reason that the age is going, should be going down, not up. Yet the age of, of professionals, Eric said, was going up. I would tell you that this is probably one of the, the reasons. Because of that experience, you gain cognitive biases, brain biases, that say, well, and, and I'm kind of using this example, but I'm pretty dumb on this stuff. When I put this charge here, it should happen down there because I've experienced it. So I, I immediately am drawn to that's probably the conclusion, right? But it might not be because the brain thinks in some really strange ways. I'm gonna give you a quick problem to do. It's a little bit of a math problem, but I wanna show you something. If I have a bat and a baseball, a baseball bat and a ball, and I tell you that these two items, one costs a dollar more than the other, and together they cost a dollar 10, how much does each one cost, quickly? Huh? Ten cents and a dollar is what most of you say, right? What's your name? What is it? Matt. Matt? Matt screws up the whole thing and he says a nickel and a dollar five. Which one's right? Do the math. One costs a dollar more than the other. Matt's the only one that got it right. See what our brain does? If I said these things are a dollar ten together and one costs a dollar more, it immediately said a dollar and ten cents, but really that's only 90 cents more than the other. See? Our brain thinks a certain way. It fills in blanks all day long. And it fills in blanks through what it thinks should happen, these cognitive biases. And that, that book I told you about, The Art of Thinking Clearly, that's why it's so important. You could go in here, read about how these biases work on our brain, identify them, and now in your decision-making process, you start to say, huh, I think this, but I remember that one of the cognitive biases told me I would think that, and it's not necessarily right. Our brain does us a great 
service as we go through the day because there's so much going on that it can't track everything. But what it does is, so it fills in all this stuff, but it fills in with what it thinks should be right. It's not always right. And once you start to identify these biases, this changes, okay? Examples of crisis thinking. Uh, I put on air crashing helicopters because this is near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the reason but is most, most pilots never crash in their careers. If you do crash, you probably crash once, right? And either it turns out really, really bad or you're like, man, I never want to do that again. I've been lucky enough to crash twice in my career. Um, so then all my buddies would be like, either Matt's the safest pilot to fly with, because there's no way this thing could happen three times to the same guy, <laughs> or he's just a really shitty pilot. <laughs> One of the two. Um, but under this crisis state, as this was happening to me, a lot of things happened to the brain. And this may have happened to you. I, the guy I was flying with, he used to carry a box of Mike and Ikes. This was on my very first crash. You know Mike and Ikes candy? Little colored, like, I don't know, little candies. Always had a box with him. And the first time we crashed, we hit. This was in Colorado Springs, so pretty high altitude airfield. We hit the ground, and the helicopter bounced 30, like 32 feet back into the air off of a bounce. It's pretty high. It means we hit pretty hard. When we hit the second time, we lost the tail rotor and we started spinning around and all this kind of crazy stuff happened. But that first big bounce, I remember looking over at him and he was doing, I was flying, I was the guy that crashed. Um, but I was real new. And so I crashed and then I look over at him and he's doing all this stuff with the controls and I thought, huh, I should probably let go. I'm not doing anything here. And then I looked up and thought, huh, these Mike and Ikes are flying around like just slow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I could probably just reach up and grab one and eat it. <laughs> now I'm thinking all this in the time it took for us to hit and come back down, right? Which is, I don't know, two seconds maybe, if, if that. But I thought all these things. Has this ever happened to any of you? We've been in a crisis state and things just slowed down, right? The brain tries to protect us. And in that time, it's searching for something. It's searching for answers. Well, the first time I crashed, I didn't have many answers. I was just bouncing along. <laughs> but the second time I crashed, I was like, oh, I know what to do. <laughs> right? So our brain starts to think differently when we go to this crisis. So how do we do that? How do we stop? Uh, that the crisis type thinking, pull it back to where we can actually think through the crisis before it even happens, right? Starting with these cognitive biases, we've kind of discussed what are they? They're just things that are put into our brain uh, that, that tell us how the world should be because this is how you were raised. All your life experiences go into these biases. Um, you're taught these in school, you're taught these in life, you're taught these by your parents, and, and you really don't even know why they're there, and you don't know that they come into your, come into your mind every day, like that baseball, baseball bat example. Can you live without these biases? Can any of us live without these biases? No, really. Uh, I mean, te yes, technically we could live without them, if that was a possibility, but it's not. They're ingrained in us. Okay? So what we need to do is to overcome them by recognizing what they, what they are, right? And there's a whole bunch of smart psychologists that did a bunch of work on this, so you don't even have to go out and do the work. You just have to pick up one of these books and read through it and be like, oh, that happens to me? Right? I think my, my oldest is 13. I got two kids, 13 and 11. My oldest is 13. Last year at 12, I had him read this book. I was like, man, what better gift could I give him than to show him all this stuff early, right? And, and he's a great kid now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what comes of this? Well, we recognize these biases 
Okay, this is the beginning of planning for this extreme event, thinking through this extreme event. We load ourselves up with the biases so we are aware of them. So when we're out there and we say, well, the snow, sh if I throw this charge, the snow should go down there, that's a bias. That's a cognitive bias that we put in. It's an experiential bias. And we say, that should happen, ah, ah, ah. But it, what if it didn't? How else could this turn out? And now I start to recognize, well, here's my other scenarios, okay? And this could be in any, any part of the field that you guys are in, right? What are the other scenarios that could play out here? And we'll talk that in a minute. So we add to that a situational awareness. All of you guys probably have a higher sense of situational awareness than most people uh, out in the world today, just by evidence of what you do, okay? So, can this be learned though? Can it be raised? Can it be heightened? Yes. And what is the reason that I want this? Well, the biggest reason I want to heighten situational awareness is so I can recognize things before they happen, okay? I'm going to use a, 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 an example, not necessarily from your field, but I think you'll get the point. If I'm right here and I'm a threat to Doug, what are Doug's options right now? What can he do? He can run where? Where could he run them? Door. Okay, that door? Where else could he run? That door? Uh, he could maybe go into the storeroom. He could throw something at me. He could throw something through that window and get out. He has a lot of options at this point. He definitely can't fight you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that segue. That's a great segue, right? What's your name? Zach, right, that's right. So, so, Doug has a lot of options. As I begin to approach Doug, do his options lessen? Right? Now he probably can't make it through that door. Now I'm gonna really screw you up. <laughs> what are Doug's options now? He should have back. <laughs> His option, if he's alone, is only to fight at that point, right? He's down to that one option, to just defend myself, okay? So, the reason I equate that with awareness is if Doug can see me here and realize my threat to him, he has lots more options than if he recognizes the threat when it's there, okay? So this is each one of us in whatever field you're in, if you're out in the, in the snow world doing what you do, if I can recognize threats from further away, I have more options available to me. So I do that through a situational awareness, understanding my terrain, understanding what's around me, understanding that who I'm with, that all plays in. If, if Doug and I, and I, Doug took me climbing for my first time ever a few years ago, I was scared out of my mind, right? And I've done a lot of things that you would think, oh, well, you shouldn't be scared of climbing. Um, where, where do we, we went to Gallatin Towers. Five, two or something. <laughs> speaking, of, speaking of which, speaking of which, how many of you guys climb? Like really climb? All right, so I've never climbed, never even been to an indoor climbing gym. And we go to Gallatin Towers and we did a three pitch climb. And he was like, okay, this is how you do it, just do it. And like, we made it, I made it to the top finally. And he was just like, dude, you crushed it. You came up so fast. And I was like, dude, cause I was scared out of my mind. <laughs> and I'm sitting at the top, just adrenaline's rushing, right? And I go, and he goes, hey, I wanna tell you, I've never actually taken anybody on the first time up here. <laughs> I go, why'd you take me? He's like, well, I just figured you figured it out. <laughs> I was like, great, thanks, right? But in those kind of situations, situational awareness says, Doug looks at me and says, this guy sucks. I have to cover for him, 
right? That's part of your situational awareness. Who are you with? What is their influence on you? Or maybe they're a super good friend and they say, no, 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 we can do this. Are you more likely to say, all right, let's try it. If it's a real close friend, sure. That's one of those cognitive biases, okay? So that situational awareness brings us to a kind of a different level of thinking of problems, right? When is it lost? It's generally lost when you're complacent and comfortable. Those are the biggest places in your guys' world. You'd be like, ah, oh, done this 40 times? No problem. Let's go to it, let's get it done, and get out of there, okay? So all this starts to lead into when this crisis happens. I'm going to let you read through this. It's a wordy slide, but I thought it's, it's important enough to know. This is the initial response in your brain to a crisis, to this extreme stress being implemented. What's it really saying here? First part says, this is the chemical reaction that happens. The brain says, oh! And all this stuff starts flooding through your body. But it needs time, now this is not a long time, but it needs time for this to happen. For, these, for all these hormones to start going to where it can kick you out. This is part of the reason that most people start that fight or flight mechanism with a freezing. Right? But it doesn't just happen right away. So to overcome this piece to where we don't hesitate and we make an immediate decision, we've been armed, we say, okay, we understand our own personal cognitive biases. This is the way we think. We're open to that to, inside of ourselves. We have a raised situational awareness. We raise our situational awareness by understanding what it is what we're confronted with, who's around us, what does the terrain look like, has this happened before, why did it happen before, all this stuff comes into our awareness. And then we understand what happens in the body when the stress event happens, okay? And we start to make a plan for things. And this is where we'll go in a little more, but I think, Ron, you were talking about it this morning, uh, to the fact that he said, before he goes to bed at night, he's thinking about, what could happen tomorrow when I do X, right? Is that something kind of close to what you said, right? Okay, so he's already started playing out scenarios in his head long before they've happened. Now, is he gonna, is he gonna just guess the scenario every time and get it right? If, if he does, he probably won't be doing what he's doing anymore because he's gonna be rich. Because he's <laughs> he predicting the future now, right? <laughs> But as I start to plan out a number of courses of action that could happen, it allows me, under an extreme stress event, it allows me to maneuver much quicker, okay? So, under this, this initial response comes in. Well, this is our decision-making process under normal conditions, generally. Normal person, again, not you guys probably, just a normal, off-the-street person, something happens, some extreme event happens, very stressful to them, right? What begins? Usually denial, meaning this can't be happening to me, right? I, this, this just is not happening. This is the beginning of the freeze portion. Then there's a deliberation. What should I do? Well, if you've had training or some life experience, you get through this, this piece of deliberation rather quickly. You say, ah, I have options, okay? But if you don't have life experience, if you haven't had any training, if you haven't taken any time to understand your cognitive biases, this takes a long time. The wheels spin, the little hamsters running around, running around, running around, running around. 
can't find an answer. So what happens? You end up like this. Oh no, oh what do I do, what do I do, oh my gosh, what do I do, what do I do? You're frozen at this point. Till finally, you respond to the crisis with some decisive action. Normally, this decisive action in an extreme stress situation is to run away or hide, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Now remember, we're talking about normal people. Anybody I could, you know, that guy sitting right there at the cafe, if all of a sudden he was faced with some crazy, a meteorite came down in the sky, was coming, he'd just be like, whoa. <laughs> right? Where I would hope that any of you, the meteorites come, you're like, whoa, that's not normal. Let me get somewhere. <laughs> Even if you didn't make it, <laughs> at least we took a decisive action, right? Said, man, what's this thing coming out of the sky? Let me go get wherever that might be. Or even go in the opposite direction, something. Okay, that's a decisive action. That's how we respond to the crisis. Okay, so how do we do this to make it the extreme situation less? All right, now, going back to what I used to do, we would put people in very bad situations, okay? Um, and in these very bad situations, we did what uh, we, well, I won't say what it's called, but we put them in like a pre-situation. So they get to go through it with no training. They're like, here, deal with this. It sucks. Okay? <laughs> then, after however long they were there in this really bad situation, pull them out. We're like, okay, now we're going to give you a bunch of training. And they're like, great. And we get to the end of the training. We're like, okay, now, here, go back in here. It's going to suck. <laughs> but at least you got some things you can practice. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, how did they get there? Well, how did we develop those plans and those people? Same way I'm telling you today. Some of that is life experience. These people had been through it once, realized it sucked, figured some things out, didn't figure other things out. Okay? And the interesting thing, this life experience that happens doesn't have to be yours. And I would say this is probably a pretty important lesson for you folks with what you do. Right? You can learn from the lessons of other people. But the trick to learning these lessons is saying, um, and uh, where's, where's Eric? Other Eric? Eric. What was your friend's name? Uh, ben. That, that was on the picture? Oh, uh, was that the guy that did the charge? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm just using his example because he used it. We can learn from Billy's example, right? As long as we don't learn from it this way, we say, oh, we don't want to do the charge like that or whatever. Don't learn from the negative piece of it. Take the event and then say, what are other possible outcomes that could have happened and how could we have made those happen? See, we start to learn by, by drawing all the information. I think Ron and I were talking about this. The more information you gain, as long as you understand your cognitive biases, the better off your planning is to help uh, in, in future things. And again, it doesn't have to be your experience, okay? Training that you can get helps in these events. And as much and as varied as possible. Don't just stick to your, your uh, world to do your training in. You know, um, I don't know, if, how many of you have skydived before? Skydove or whatever. <laughs> Okay, a couple of you. What lessons then from skydiving could you take from that experience and then put into what you do now? There's lessons there that you could use. You maybe just haven't thought through them. But because you've done it, that stuff's packed into your brain somewhere. And so when this crisis hits, this extreme stress hits that you may face in your, in your work or even in your personal life, because that's there, a lesson you've learned you can pull and, and draw from that. So as much training as you can do, as varied as you can do. In the special operations world, there are weird, weird things. You'd be like, well, why does everybody have to go have to learn how to drive a bulldozer? Like, that doesn't even make sense. Okay? But there's a reason everybody drives a bulldozer. 
right? Because you're learning lessons that, that somewhere down the line will help you. I hit, I hit on the planning piece very much. In the unit I used to be in, when we would do an operation, we would do like a kind of a three-tiered planning. We would plan the entire mission. And I'm talking, this is very, very, very in-depth. We would plan the entire mission. And then we would plan a secondary plan. If this doesn't work, then we're going to do this, right? A contingency plan. And then we would go so far as the planning to say, if this doesn't work and this doesn't work, then we have contingency plans off of the, I mean, tertiary plans off the contingency plan. And people are like, man, that's a whole lot of planning. And guess what? Hardly ever did anything go wrong. Hardly ever. And we could be doing the same exact mission. Nobody cut and pasted one thing. We replanned it all the way through. Okay? And I would suggest that in whatever you're doing, look at the planning piece and say, okay, this is probably what's going to happen. And, and, and as Ron said, he's like thinking through some of these like, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to happen, but maybe not. It might be this or this, right? And then we kind of come up with our initial plan. I call this the what-if game, okay? So imagine, and I'm going to use Billy's example again, uh, Eric. Um, the what-if game would look like this. I'm up on the mountain, and I go, normally, when I set this charge, in this type of terrain, this is what happens. So that's probably my initial plan, right? At least the beginning of it. Then I look around and say, what else could happen? And I play this what if game. What if the charge, I don't know, I don't know how this works. So what if the charge went off early or late? Where would I be standing? What if when that happened, the ground right here is different than I thought it was. What if, and we start to run this what if game, okay? An easier example I could tell you for all of us to understand is um, you're, sitting in a, you're sitting in a restaurant. Um, we're, we're sitting in Montana L Works at six o'clock today. <laughs> and, and this is a crazy extreme example. The kitchen catches on fire. What do you do? Well, my what if game goes like this, and, and unfortunately I do this everywhere I go, but it becomes not a paranoia, but a preparation, right? And I tell you the difference. <laughs> I'll tell you the difference. Paranoid is if you drove over here in your vehicle, and the whole way over you were like, oh my gosh, I know I'm gonna get a flat tire. I am gonna get a flat tire. I am gonna get a flat tire. Paranoid means you believe something's going to happen to you, okay? Preparation is you don't even think about it because you got the spare in the, in the back. That's the difference, right? Same exact event, I'm driving over here, two different ways of thinking about it. So me going into a restaurant usually goes, you know, I want to point that out. It's not paranoia, it's preparation. <laughs> Whenever I walk into a building, I always identify, as soon as I walk in, where are the exits, where are the entrances, how could I get out of here if I had to, okay? That's the first thing. And um, I was at a, doing a corporate thing a couple of years ago, and I said, if I go into a restaurant with my wife, where do I sit? Somebody's like, with your back against the wall. I was like, eh, not really, but in a way, right? I, I want to know how to get out of this place. Who's my threat in this place? Those are the things I look for everywhere I go, right? <laughs> Not in a paranoid way. <laughs> so, and I said, and I said, um, why doesn't my wife do this? And they said, probably because you're better trained. And I said, no, because she's a woman. She couldn't do that. And this was in a corporate environment. There was probably 70% women. The whole thing stopped. And I did, I mean, I did pan it perfect. I was like, no, because she's a woman. She couldn't do it. And then I just paused. This thing just stopped. One of the ladies said, you're sexist. 
And I said, I'm also just kidding. You know, and everybody laughed. But I said, no, because I have more training. And I said, but when my wife's in a place and she's there with her friends, she does that, okay? To play this what if game. So what if the kitchen caught on fire tonight? What would you do? Run out? Okay, well, if you run out, you have to know where to run out. Like we said in here, if I'm here, Doug's there and I'm a threat, what are his options? Well, if you don't know your options, if you don't play this what if game, if you don't do this out on the mountain or out on the highways or wherever you are, like right now I'm playing a crazy what if game as I'm watching these two police officers walk by our window. Like, I'm like, is there some bad guy in here? What if, what if there is a bad guy? Did they take care of him? No. <laughs> Just kidding, that's paranoia. <laughs> so, so, but I play this what if game, right? What if, there, what if there's a fire? And I, and I play this game, like, you guys could, I live in, over in Belgrade. Uh, you guys could come to my house right now and I can tell you that my kids' windows in their, in their bedroom are unlocked, okay? So you could come try to get into my house. Um, and the reason I have them unlocked is because if there was a fire in our house between my room and their room, I understand because I've thought it through, I've what if it, that manual dexterity, especially in children, goes away under extreme stress. So they couldn't even open the lock on their window to get out of their window. So I what if the game and stay a step ahead of them. So the, door, the window's unlocked, sliding windows, but I keep a bar on the window. So all they have to do is remove the bar, which is a large motor skill movement, not small, and remove the bar, they can open the window, right? So I what if things in life. And that's what I would tell you, no matter what you're doing in life, no matter if you're on the mountain, if you're out on the highways doing these things, what if, what could happen? Not just the most likely outcome, but three or four levels of those outcomes. And then live that general awareness. All right, so I understand cognitive biases about myself. I raise my level of situational awareness, so my brain kind of looking at the world in a different way, okay? I start to plan, I get training, I have life experience. I formulate these initial plans like Ron's talking about, I start playing this what if game. What are my options in my situation? This is all leading up to the crisis. Then the extreme stress event hits. How do I respond? Okay? Well, all of those things that you've been doing will increase the coping mechanisms in your brain when that event occurs because you've taken out so much of the unknown, you've taken out 85, 90% of the unknown by working through different scenarios, thinking through this, having a greater awareness about what's happening around you, getting training, that you've taken out a lot of the unknown and that's what the unknown is the piece that causes a lot of our coping mechanisms not to work. And when the coping mechanisms don't work, we hesitate. We get into the denial phase. Like, uh, this cannot be happening to me right now. Okay? Again, you might be looking at me right now and saying, Matt, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? Because as we sit here, as we watch the monkey business illusion, we think we know how our brains work, but it's not quite how they work under stress. Look at the stuff you miss just when you're looking at that video. That's no stress involved. I'm just telling you, this is not me, this is science. At the places I worked, we use this stuff, right? So those coping mechanisms mainly come from fear of the unknown. And if you do all these things we're talking about, it takes those away, you don't hesitate. Here's a huge piece. In these events, do something. And you say, I say, your brain will thank you later. People that don't do anything under stress, they sit and go, oh my gosh. They survive the stress, and it's very hard to live with themselves. Because they have all this guilt and shame about, oh, I should have done X. I should have done this. You know, when there, whenever there's one of these crazy like mass shootings that happen, um, 
the, they do interviews after the fact with people and they say, oh, Luke, you know, you knew, you know, Billy Bob who did the shooting, you were his neighbor. What did you think? What do they all say, generally? They never saw it coming. Never saw it coming. He was just quiet, he kept to himself. I never thought he could do something. Do you know why every interview is like that? There's a real, there's a scientific reason, a brain reason. Because Luke doesn't want to admit subconsciously he knew. He saw things that happened. Now, most of that is the headline and then it goes away and you don't see it again. I do a lot of research on those things. And what happens afterwards, they do follow-up interviews a week later. And by then, the people have processed and Luke goes, well, now that I think about it, one time my dog walked over on his lawn and he killed my dog. <laughs> and you're like, you didn't think that was a red flag? <laughs> right? But the brain does things that we don't think it will do. And we don't even understand why it does it until you get really deep in there. So if you're in an extreme stress situation, do something. It doesn't even have to be the right thing. Now, with all the stuff we talked about, as you develop that, it will be the right thing. But even if that thing is just running away and you survive, inside of you, you say, I did something. I didn't just sit there and let something happen to me, okay? So, hesitation is a killer. Don't hesitate, right? And with all this stuff, you won't as you develop this. Final tactic, have anybody heard combat breathing? Anybody? So combat breathing is nothing to it really. It's just breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. Deep breaths, what it does is brings your heart rate down. And when your heart rate comes down under crisis, under extreme stress, our brain starts to react and think better. Okay? And it's just, Some of you probably do this already when you're under stressful situations, even small stress. But under huge stress, this is a very helpful tool. It starts to slow your heart rate, brings things into perspective, okay? This works, I, I promise you. I, I pro I've done this, been through situations where I had to do this, and it works very well. Implement this, and just start trying it now under small bits of stress. When something happens to you during the day, Okay, wrapping up here. This is what I tell people, a prevention formula. Okay, this is for extreme stress. When we're thinking, if we've done all these things, we've figured out what cognitive biases that really affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of research into those, we get them and say, this affects me, so to overcome this, I realize it affects me. We raise our situational awareness level so we're more we're, we're looking outward instead of just at the task at hand. We're not just looking at how many times the team in white passes the ball. We're looking at the whole picture. Let's take some practice. Do it when you walk around town. Do it when you walk into a room. How I do this with my two kids, I say, when we walk into REI, just using that as an example, what will we see on the wall up on the right-hand side? They don't know. I don't care if they get the answer right or not. What it does is when they walk through the door, they're looking around. So you can do the same thing to yourself. Train yourself through that. Start to, start to open your vision, okay? We need the awareness. If we have no awareness, the only things happening is you're reacting to a situation, okay? If we have all the awareness we want, but we override it and we say, uh, it looks, it looks kind of shady right here. Like, uh, but it'll probably work out. We've taken no real action to what our brain's actually thinking. So we don't prevent an incident from happening. The way to prevent the incident from happening, have the awareness, trust what you're saying, think through your, your plans that you've laid, your initial plans and build on those what-if scenarios and then take an action. That's how we prevent major things from happening under stress, okay? You can do something. The way to prevent it is that action has to be appropriate. The way to get that appropriate action, 
is to do these things we've talked through today in this last hour, okay? No awareness or no willingness to act makes you vulnerable in all, in all that you're doing out there, right? In summary, crisis causes changes in your brain. You might not believe me, all I can do is, is feed that to you and say that's true, right? Awareness and the preparation piece is the key to overcoming these events with a, with a successful outcome, right? Understanding this process that we talk to helps you then to stay ahead of the game, right? That's what I have for you. I, I hope it's helpful. Before I leave, I'll, I'll finish up with a story so you don't think, especially because many of you over the years will probably meet my wife. Um, <laughs> so yes, she gets a lot of training, but she gets to give it back too. Uh, a few years ago, she was going to Turkey. It was 2014, I guess, five years ago. And ISIS was kind of uh, strong at that point. And uh, she was going over there to help out a friend for a couple weeks. And so she wanted some training. She was like, huh, can, I, can we do some training? I said, what do you want? She said, I, I need to know how to defend myself. You know, you've taught me a couple things. I said, yeah, I'll teach you a couple real easy things. First one is, you know, a carotid artery strike, where you just hit with your, side, your hand on the side of the person's neck, and it knocks them out. I said, but you got to hit it hard enough. So she hit about four or five times, not hard enough, hard enough to hurt, but not hard enough to affect me. And I said, okay, we're done with that. So she said, all right, then, how about you teach me how to choke somebody out? And I was like, yeah, I can do that. She grabs, reaches up, tell her how this is how you do it. Ah! And finally she sinks, and, I'm, and now we got the kids, they're playing, they're playing their little video games, we got a bunch of couch cushions down. It's a nice family day. <laughs> She's choking me out, I, I'm like, there it is, now squeeze. I'm like, throw your legs around me, like squeeze, squeeze. She's squeezing, and I feel myself about to pass out. I'm like, there you go. So I reach up and tap out. How many of you do not know what tap out means? <laughs> Tap out means let go, because I'm about to pass out. But I forgot to tell her, so I failed. Tap out, nothing happens, out I go. Come back a second or two later, I'm like, whoa, great job. She's like, ah! I'm like, that was it. Now, the stories, the stories diverge whether you hear her tell a story or me tell a story. When I tell a story, I came to, she was like, ah! And she, and she was saying, this is what she says, oh no, I thought I killed you. I heard it like this, oh no, I thought I killed you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which one's right, but, but I tell you, so she gets hers. So I know we're, we're over time right now. Um, does anybody have any questions that I can answer quickly? I'll be around a bit, because I don't want to cut too much into whoever's uh, next up. Anyone have any questions for the group that I could clear up quickly? I have something to go. I mean, just yeah, yeah. from the beginning, what I was noticing, right, like, I knew that the gorilla was coming that I had seen it before. Yeah. So I was focusing on that. It was harder to count, right, when I was looking for the gorilla and looking for other things. Right. And so just thinking about, right, like, if you, obviously counting's not that hard of a task, but if you're doing something really challenging, sure. the more other things make me think about Ron, of like, right, he's like, you know, I'm gonna wear the same clothes, I'm gonna eat the same lunch to simplify life That's so we can focus on the important things. Right. But I, yeah, I know in terms of balancing that where it, you know, having the situational awareness, yeah. like at some point you gotta choose focus or the big picture. So that's that's why I say Ian, as you as if you were to follow this process where you, you're learning of your own cognitive biases, you sort through those and those are kind of out of the picture now. You can plan for those already. You say, well, I usually think like this, but it's really not the right way to be thinking in this situation, and it helps you to develop those plans like Ron's talking about. It goes into the what-if game, right? And we start to what-if the situation before it ever occurs, so we're more prepared. A lot of times you'll hear sports, especially in the sports world, we visualize, you know, you might visualize making the, making the free throw or whatever. Kind of the same concept. And then the raising of awareness. So what it does is that task you're focused on, you can now pull back. You can still see the task and focus on it, but you have a wider vision because a lot of the things you've pulled out, you've already said, okay, I know I'm expecting this, 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 this. 
So you're expecting them. So if they come, you can react. But you don't, you don't have to be like focused and then one of these things comes and hits you upside the head because you never even thought about it happening. So that's what I would say. You can still focus, but you pull back to a bigger picture if you're doing these things. So How do you ever get control of the chemical release that we go through when imminent doom is facing you in a crisis? Yep. So I mean, is that from training? Can you yeah. So you're, you from your life experience and your training, really. And and believe it or not, what we talked about in here, even though it's just a just a one hour talk, this actually the way the brain works, this sets into your brain. There's going to be some things that might happen in the next couple of weeks where you're going to get into a situation that because you've even heard these things, because that seed's been planted, you'll be able to use them even before you really start to develop them out if, if you choose to develop these things. That chemical process can be overcome. The biggest one in, in the normal world is that breathing technique, bringing down the heart rate rather quickly because when your heart rate beating above 175, 180 beats per minute uh, threshold, and that's just a general guideline, your brain and the chemicals being released is completely different than if I can pull it down even to the 140s, right? Uh, the way the brain reacts and thinks changes it. So that breathing one is, is a big one that I could give you right now that's easy to start doing uh, as you kind of develop out this training module for yourself. So, Doug, I know we're kind of butting up against some time, so you want to move on to get into who, who's next? I'll, I'll, I'll be around, that. yeah. If, if there's a fire at works tonight, you're following. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to know who lit the fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that'll, be the, that'll be the final exam. Yeah. We're all at Aleworks and be like, there's a fire in the kitchen? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I want you to come and do uh, uh, guides training for our guide service down in the Detons this uh, in uh, early July. Sure. Stock. Yeah, I'm always open to helping good people. I, 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 I think that's a good thing. Yeah, most of them. We'll talk. Yeah. All right. I think I should finish so we got the next person up. I appreciate your time. I hope you got something out of it.